thank you for tuning in to yet another edition of COVID-19. I'm Min San Hee. We are commemorating a very special day today, that is International Nurses' Day, a day observed throughout the world on May 12th, that is the anniversary of Florence Nightingale's birth, to mark the contributions of the nursing community. We have more on that later on in the program, but as always, we start with the headlines with our Kwon Soa and Noaram. Welcome. Hello. So let's start with the domestic updates. The Itaewon outbreak has officials here on high alert. Yes, while we continue to have double-digit increases in daily cases, most of them are attributed to uh, that case in Itaewon. But compared to the past two days, Tuesday's official figures have declined. So let's take a closer look at the latest updates. We have 27 new cases, and that brings the total number to 10,936. So 27 is uh, lower than on Monday and Sunday when we saw new cases cases in their 30s. Meanwhile, the death toll stands at 258. Uh, for the first time in five days, we have two fatalities added and uh, just a little over 1,000 people remain in quarantine, while uh, 38 have been discharged after making a full recovery. Now, most of the new cases were found in and around Seoul, with 12 in the capital as of 12 a.m. And we have eight nearby in Gyeonggi-do province and one in in Incheon, as well as two cases in Daejeon, and a few more cases in the city of Daegu, in Gyeongsangbukdo and Gyeongsangnamdo provinces, and one case was detected at the airport, while five were imported cases. Now, last week on May 6th, we had just two new infections, but as we can see here on this graph, cases climbed following the Itaewon clubber that's now linked to the dozens of people added to the tally in the past few days. I suppose so. What is important now is to ensure that the numbers not surge as they did in Tegu. Right, and that is why the government as well as the Seoul Metropolitan Government are doing all they can to make sure that uh, we don't have more secondary infections as well as tertiary infections. And this meaning anyone suspected of being exposed to the virus should get tested. Seoul Mayor Park Won Soon at an earlier briefing said more than 7,200 people have received screenings for the COVID-19 virus in the capital, while some 3,500 received tests on Sunday, the number jumped to 6,500 yesterday, and Park attributed the almost twice as large number of people having gone to testing facilities to the city's promise to keep those testings anonymous. Meanwhile, according to Seoul's latest updates, a total of 101 cases were linked to the Itaewon clubber or Yongin 66th patient, with 64 of those infections in Seoul. The mayor noted how at least 36 percent are no symptom patients expressing concerns of a fast contagion and a surge in cases would also mean more work for medical workers of course at the forefront in battling the virus including nurses who have been praised by authorities also at the morning coronavirus briefing earlier on today's international nurses day Right. Meanwhile, so on the international front, let's begin with the Gulf region. Mm -hmm. Well, the number of total COVID-19 cases in the six Gulf Arab states surpassed 100,000 on the Monday, with Saudi Arabia having the largest number of infections at over 41,000 with 255 fatalities. Almost 2,000 new cases were reported in the kingdom on Monday alone. Health authorities believe the virus may infect up to 200,000 people in the country, home to more than 30 million people. Qatar, with a population of just 2.8 million, recorded over 23,600 cases with 14 deaths, while the United Arab Emirates has around 18,200 cases and almost 200 have died so far as of Monday. Gulf states took early measures against travel-linked infections, but a spread among migrant workers has emerged as another big risk factor. Now, meanwhile, over in Turkey, the lowest number of daily cases since late March was recorded Monday with 1,114 testing positive with 55 deaths. While Turkey's president Recep Tayyip Erdogan announced a four day curfew through a public holiday to be implemented beginning May 16th. 
And in the U.S., following a number of infections among the White House staff, U.S. President Donald Trump gave an order to wear masks all the time, except when they are seated at desks and socially distant from others. Uh, Trump himself did not wear a mask at Monday's press briefing, as we can see here, saying he kept, quote, far away from everyone. Now, the U.S., meanwhile, has suffered more than 81,700 deaths with a total of 1.38 million cases. And we can see that the U.K. and Italy have 32,000 and 30,000 deaths, respectively. And uh, Russia now has more total cases than Italy. Uh, and uh, although the death toll remains uh, comparably, comparably low uh, to, uh, when you compare the numbers to other uh, regions in Europe. And taking a brief look at the entire world, all of the places here in uh, color red are being affected by the highly contagious virus that's now killed over 287,200 people. 4.25 million total cases have been recorded, while 1.5 million have so far recovered. All right, so I thank you for that. I'll be back to you after the briefing. Okay. Adam, the government is desperate to find those who went to clubs and bars in Itaewon, but the task is proving to be tougher than thought. It is certainly a race against the clock as younger people often go to Itaewon, and these younger people often tend to move around a lot more as well. So that obviously increases the risk of uh, further infection to other areas. So health authorities have urged people who visited Itaewon in late April and early May to voluntarily get checked for the virus. However, this is proving difficult as not everyone is cooperating with that uh, advice. And entry logs at the clubs in question turned out to carry false information as well in many cases and many young people are also concerned about their identities being revealed uh, possibly and so are keeping quiet uh, and as I mentioned the government is looking for a way to get these people to come forward while guaranteeing anonymity and there are also cases where potential patients may not feel the need to get tested as they aren't really showing any symptoms and obviously they are a younger generation so they might not feel uh, symptoms as much as the older generation. Now the government has so far only managed to get in touch with about half of some 5,500 people who visited the affected facilities and meanwhile Seoul City has asked mobile carriers in the country to submit a list of people whose mobile phones were connected to base stations in Itaewon so they have a log of that and the city government has managed to secure a list of nearly 11,000 visitors in the area at the time through the data provided by the mobile carriers. And it is because of this uh, outbreak that the government has also decided to delay the opening of schools, Adam. That's right. The schools were supposed to open their doors to high school seniors first tomorrow, in fact. But the Education Ministry has decided, after much debate, to delay the reopening by another week to next Wednesday. Uh, the Ministry said it was meant to guarantee the safety of students, of course. And students in other grades will return to school gradually over the following weeks into June. There are, however, calls from local education offices for a further the delay as students and parents alike are still concerned over the recent spike in cases and they think it will continue. Uh, Seoul City's education superintendent, for example, said additional delays should be discussed next week. But of course, the education ministry is the decision maker in that regard and no stance on further school postponements have been revealed just yet. However, if cases continue to spike, then it is highly likely that schools uh, could keep their doors shut for much longer. I see. Meanwhile, the head of the Global Health Organization organization had some words to say about Korea's recent dilemma. That's right. Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus was optimistic despite concerns of a second wave of infections in Korea as well as in countries such as China and Germany. Uh, at a press conference in Geneva on Monday, he said these nations were capable of stopping such a crisis. Have a listen. Fortunately, all three countries have systems in place to detect and respond to a resurgence in cases. Now, despite that, he did warn that if the disease persists in countries at a low level without the capacity to identify and investigate clusters, then there is always the risk that the disease will take off again. He also urged countries to take, quote, extreme vigilance as they begin to ease their lockdowns. He added that lifting restrictions was complex and difficult and that the, quote, slow, steady lifting of lockdowns was key. All right, Adam, thank you for that. We'll see you again tomorrow. Time now for the afternoon briefing on COVID-19. Concerns continue as health authorities seek to reach thousands of people who are believed to have been at Seoul's Itaewon district during the same time that an earlier infected person went clubbing there, club hopping that is. 
We will come back to you after the regular briefing. First of all, here is Mr. Kwon joon with the briefing. Let us now begin our regular briefing for May 12th, Tuesday, on the COVID-19 outbreak response in the country. Newly confirmed cases stands at 27 as of yesterday, and the total number of confirmed cases stands at 10,936. This includes 1,138 imported cases from overseas, and 90.3 percent of them are South Korean nationals. And 38 more people have been discharged, and the total stands at 9,670, uh, and a total of 1,008 people are in quarantine undergoing treatment. Unfortunately, we had two more fatalities as of yesterday, and I extend my deepest condolences to the deceased and the members of the bereaved families. And the regional breakdown is as follows. We had five imported cases while 22 were community transmissions. And of the 22, uh, in Seoul there were 12, in Gyeonggi there were 8. Out of the 27 uh, new cases, the f uh, five were imported and community transmission stands at 22. And the countries uh, were Americas, Europe, and Africa, and others. And as for the community transmission, which stands at 22, uh, 21 of them were related to the Itaewon Club cluster infection, and one was related to a cluster infection in Tegu, and 11 of them were the clubbers, and also 10 others were the contacts, and a total of 21 new confirmed cases were related to the Itaewon Club case. And we also had nine more cases of Itaewon case, and now the total number relation to the Itaewon case stands at 102. Uh, we are currently doing the contact tracing as well as epidemiological testings right now. And 64 of them are in Seoul, and 24 of them are in Gyeonggi-do province, while seven are from Incheon. And the route is as follows. Uh, 73 people are uh, the clubbers who were there, and 29 are uh, the uh, the contacts of them. And the Tegu case, uh, one uh, confirmed case, was the family member of the previously confirmed case. Uh, the KCDC is highlighting that if anyone who visited uh, any of the nightclub entertainment venues, like clubs and bars, include uh, at uh, the Itaewon facility, Itaewon uh, zone, from uh, 24th of April to 6th of May, uh, is likely to have been exposed to the virus. So we ask everyone to visit the low uh, locations to have uh, screening testings as soon as possible. And at, at the medical centers and uh, the screening centers, we will also uh, be carrying out the diagnostic testings, even though they sh do not show symptoms. And at the current, we are seeing a surge in the coronavirus outbreak, especially on the community level, so we need to continue to be vigilant. And starting from May 8th, according to the administrative order that has been uh, put in place, we are recommending that all nightlife establishments suspend operations for a month. And if uh, these facilities need to be open, they need to comply with uh, the guidelines. And also, the municipalities have put in place uh, orders, uh, administrative orders to ban uh, further gatherings and large-scale gatherings. And if they need to stay open, uh, they need to also take uh, the uh, take all of the visitors to wear their masks when uh, they are inside these facilities and they also need to designate a manager who will uh, be in charge of uh, the infection control and uh, prevention and they need to write an entry log and if these breach these are bre breached, uh, they will be uh, subject to fine as well as seize in businesses. And we also encourage uh, the members of the public to carefully follow the five infection prevention rules. And we also uh, advise all of uh, the public to avoid visiting any places that makes it easy to come in close contact with many others, uh, and oh, these include uh, nightclubs and bars. And if you show symptoms, uh, do not go outside or do not go to work. 
please contact our uh, call centers at 1339 and please get tested as soon as possible. And we also encourage the medical hospitals to get to have these people uh, tested even though they do not show symptoms. And we have a few messages as for the, in relation to the related uh, recent cluster infection. And this cluster infection uh, has in implies a diverse um, scenarios and the utmost and the op most optimistic case uh, the scenario would be identifying uh, the patients at an early uh, early stage and the worst scenario would be a widespread cluster of infection followed by a delay in the identification of further uh, patients. Right now, it is not a time uh, for us to judge uh, what is right or wrong, but we need to identify the patients as soon as possible, and we need to identify them and track them down. And as for the infection in Itaewon, uh, we believe that the medical centers have been very crucial. And on May 5th, they have reported a suspicious uh, case, and this shows uh, that uh, the quarantine scheme is uh, very effective and practical. And we also see an increase in the number of screening testings, as well as reportings by the healthcare facilities. And this also believes that our quarantine scheme is working very effectively. Nevertheless, we still see some of the uh, rooms for improvement, and majorly uh, our complacency could lead to another big cluster infection. As we saw in the Itaewon case, that is, we we believe uh, that the social distancing campaign uh, was not kept and the list of the uh, entry log was not accurate. And also, this is why we have great concerns of voluntary reporting of these uh, visitors. And this quarantine authorities, we would like to go back to uh, base zero and we would like to deal with uh, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak once again. And we believe that we cannot uh, repeat our experience of having a big surge in the exponential surge in the number of COVID-19 confirmed cases. And we must halt uh, the infections uh, among the community. And we also need always to keep an alert and keep in mind that the virus can spread exponentially among people. It exists anywhere and it can spread anywhere through anyone. And this is something that we need to keep in mind Moreover, COVID-19, as mentioned multiple times, it can spread very fast among uh, asymptomatic patients. So many of the patients could be mild, showing mild symptoms, and uh, they the infectious rate is even higher before uh, the patients show symptoms. And the infectious rate is uh, therefore very high. And as young people show uh, no symptoms or mild symptoms, the infection rate is uh, very high among these people, and the virus can act as a silent um, infection. And we could also have a possible surge of the uh, a number of confirmed cases going forward. So continue to abide by the distancing measures in our daily lives going forward. And moreover, if uh, there is a confirmed case of COVID-19 and this person is uh, is not it's just one person who needs to get testing uh, and treatment so uh we believe that any types of discrimination and isolation uh, would actually hinder the process of quarantine um, measures and we believe that our um if effective uh, measure in, suc uh, in successfully containing the virus is a very crucial during the uh, this week and the next week. And these two weeks are very crucial in terms of uh, combating the COVID-19. And if you sh uh, show symptoms or if you are suspicious or if you have visited these areas during the same time, uh, we once again highlight but stay home and contact the local public health center to get testings. Thank you very much. 
Right, that was the government's afternoon briefing on the COVID-19 situation here in Korea. And I have Swa with me still in the studio to give us a summary of the key announcements. Yes, well, as of 12 p.m., a total of 102 people are now confirmed to have been linked to the Itaewon case, which means that's one more than as of 10 a.m. And uh, 73 of those were reportedly visitors of the clubs the patient from Yongin went to, and 29 were people who had contact with the clubber. Now, Kwon Junok, the vice director of the KCDC also mentioned there were five imported cases among those people that entered from America, Europe and Africa. And he also mentioned that there was an increase of screening related to the Itaewon case, uh, saying the government's screening, uh, the quarantine scheme is working effectively. All right. So thank you for that. We'll see you again tomorrow. All right. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the program today, May 12th is International Nurses Day. And to commemorate the occasion, I have here in the studio Shin Sang Ne, Vice President of the International Council of Nurses, to share with us the sacrifices being made by nursing workers across the globe and on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome to the studio. Hi. Now, it goes without saying that the year 2020 has perhaps been or continues to be one of the most challenging for the mm -hmm. nursing community across the globe as they fight the global pandemic. What are your thoughts? Yes, indeed. Korean nurses, as we all know, did a great job in fighting with COVID-19 on the front line. In, in, Mar Mar uh, in March, we had close to 4,000 nurse volunteers who were willing to go out to fight on the front line. And those nurses who are retired nurses, those uh, who had uh, registered, registered, newly registered nurses, and we even had a, a newly married couples who were willing to go out. And they all showed courageous DNA in our hearts in the time of national disaster. Right, which is precisely why mass messages of gratitude and words of support have been streaming in for nurses working around the clock under some very tough conditions. Among those messages, what was the most touching for you personally? As you mentioned, uh, on the day of uh, health, that was in April, the President Moon praised nurses as a heroes. And he even stressed that nurses were in the core center of medical system. And uh, we received overwhelming support and encouragement and love from the public. And that really touched the nurses' heart. And that really helped the nurses to hold on in their difficult times. And, and many of you would remember that thanks to you challenge that went on and on and on. And that really, was really helpful, yes. And I'd like to say thank you to all uh, who have gave us full support and encouragement and love. I really appreciate. Uh, what are some of the pressing issues being faced by the nursing community uh, amid their battle against COVID-19? In Korea, the number of newly registered nurses is highest among OECD countries, but a number of nurses who actually work in the field is about one third of average of OECD countries. We have about 20,000 newly graduate nurses every year who get their license and get employed, but we, about 40% of them leave their job in within one year. Why is that? We have uh, really, uh, their working condition has to be improved. Actually, the medical act, it rules out certain ratio of patient to nurse ratio, but actually in the field, that is not guaranteed all the time. And um, 
you know, we have ac accumulated much of knowledge through our experience with Mar MERS and SAR and, and of course COVID-19 this year. Uh, but we have to break down the palliative system of just relying on the sacrifice of nurses. There should be a concrete contingency plan to systematically educate professional nurses specialized in infection. We all know that we cannot win this battle without nurses. Nurses deserve to be protected from the virus. They deserve proper treatment. And officially, we should be protected by our independent nursing law, which we don't have at this point. I see. Hopefully that will change in the future then. Yes. Meanwhile, before you go, what do, you, do you have some words that is of encouragement for nurses across the globe who are continuing to fight the contagion? COVID-19 is not over yet. And it seems like we are starting the new battle. And um, I would like to emphasize the importance of keeping the government guidelines on the prevention of infection and, of course, social distancing in our lives. We fully understand this uh, situation of COVID-19 has taken away our daily lives. And uh, we need to remember that single carelessness that recently happened can demolish all the efforts we have built up together. And, and this is a Nurses' Day, May 12, and we are celebrating internationally. And I'd like to take this opportunity to express our, on behalf of nurses, our sincere uh, appreciation to all of you who have supported us and gave us encouragement and gave us love. We can promise you that nurses will be there with patients to save lives, and we will do our best. Thank you very much. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your sacrifices. Thank, thank you. you for making the time to join us today. Thank you very much. And what happened should never, ever have happened. China should have informed us that they had a problem. <laughs> 2019 of COVID-19 on the world's geopolitical landscape is undeniable. Trade disputes between Washington and Beijing have in recent days given way to a fresh war of words over the origin of the pandemic, even in light of the regional stability uh, that is, and uh, given issues related to North Korea, and they still remain a concern. For more on this reality, I have Professor Park Won Gon from Handong Global University. Welcome, Professor Park. Thank you for having me. And I have William Gallo, the Seoul Bureau Chief of the Voice of America. Thank you for being here, William. Thank you. Professor Park, back in February, Washington praised Beijing's containment efforts with regard to COVID-19. And in recent days, Washington is now holding Beijing accountable for the origin of the pandemic. What explains the sudden shift in narrative? I think that there are several reasons. First, recently, we are now knowing that the uh, very initial stage of COVID the spread in, the, uh, in China the Chinese government is kind of a cover up the, some of the facts. Because in February, the Chinese uh, scholars and they released their own articles and said that on November, early November, they are finding the first confirmed case. But the Chinese government officially mentioned that the first case had been found in December. So in the States, there are so called six weeks difference between the first case. Six weeks is very important if China has released this kind of information six weeks before, and then many countries all over the world and they have time to prepare. So that's the first one. And second one is more, uh, you know, the uh, grand kind of uh, the hegemonic struggle or competition between China and the United States. It already got started before the COVID-19, but it's kind of intensified of this COVID-19. It is, uh, we all know that the United States 
has a difficult time while China has uh, kind of successfully get out from this uh, COVID-19. At this very moment, we are not sure whether it's going to be continued or not. But so that's kind of uh, you know another reason that China, the United States has criticized China a lot. And finally, because of the President Trump, because his motivation, especially this, this uh, November, there are presidential election, but at this very moment, the President Trump, the supporting rate has been dropped because of this, his dealing with the COVID. And on the other hand, the Joe Biden, the actually de facto, the candidate for the Democratic Party, he's uh, got the more support compared to the Trump. So that's why Trump has criticized China with Joe Biden. So that's one of his campaign strategies. I see. Uh, William, the U.S. appears to be facing quite a bit of criticism in recent days for lacking a sense of uh, sportsmanship, if I may, in the global arena, given global efforts to fight the pandemic. It skipped a virtual summit on vaccine development earlier this month. It uh, blocked a U.N. resolution asking for a global ceasefire to focus on tackling COVID-19. Uh, how is the U.S. media dealing with these uh, developments. To be honest, the U.S. media is pretty consumed with what's happening in the U.S. at this moment. I think, as uh, Dr. Park suggested, uh, we are having troubles in many ways uh, with, with dealing with this COVID situation. And that just naturally leads to a lot of domestic coverage in the media. Uh, I think the media in the U.S. has also gotten into this pattern of just sort of responding to whatever Donald Trump does and whatever he says. And he says a lot of things. And so <laughs> there isn't much discussion about the role the U.S. should play in this global pandemic. I think a lot of it is just sort of dealing with the situation, sort of dealing with Trump, muddling through right now. So maybe that explains part of the reason why you aren't seeing uh, the traditional role played by the U.S. when it comes to like leadership uh, in a global pandemic or crisis. How is the media responding to, uh, to, infamy, to uh, accusations by the U.S. government that China is to blame for the entire pandemic? Well, I can't stress this enough. I mean, in the U.S., the narrative is driven by Trump. And whatever Trump says in the morning or tweets, this is sort of what is talked about. So if he decides to make an accusation that day, then the, the media cycle sort of depends on that. So, I mean, there are people who are somewhat uh, pushing back against that narrative that, that maybe some would call a conspiracy theory. Um, but there are others who actually blame China for this as well, because as, as Dr. Park suggested, China has not uh, perhaps acted as, as uh, forthrightly as they could have, and they've covered some things up. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very popular to be anti-China in Washington, D.C. right now. Staying, <laughs> uh, staying with that, Professor Park, do you mm -hmm. agree this anti-China sentiment? Do you see it escalating? Yes, of course. So I told you about this hegemonic struggle competition between the United States and China. That's a very popular issue in the, especially Washington, D.C. Even people who oppose the President Trump and the, uh, his policy, but many people, including Joe Biden, and he's a very strong position against the China. So it's going to be a prolonged kind of competition between these two great powers. Mm. And now for more on U.S.-China relations, I have Joseph Chang, a retired political science professor in Hong Kong. Welcome to the program, Professor Chang. I understand we have yet to connect with him. Is he yes. there? Professor Chang? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. No Thank problem. Thank you for joining us. Professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. No problem. All right. U.S. lawmakers, Professor, are reportedly calling on more than 50 countries around the world to support Taiwan's inclusion in the World Health Organization. How is China reacting to this? Well, China certainly opposes this act. Uh, but Chinese leaders also understand that this is not the official position of the Donald Trump administration. Uh, China certainly treats the Taiwan issue as its core interest. Uh, it understands that this is a symptom of the increasingly adverse sentiments against China in the U.S. public and in the international community. Certainly, it expects more similar pressures in the presidential election year in the United States. But unfortunately, it has not changed its position. And, in, and under adverse domestic and international conditions, Chinese leaders seem to stick to their uh, rather hawkish line in response. 
Professor, starting May 11, the U.S. has adopted new rules tightening visa screening for Chinese journalists in the, in the latest tit-for-tat, that is, media crackdown between these two countries. What do you suppose has led to the latest surge in tensions between the two countries? Well, this is the third round. Initially, the U.S. restricts uh, freedoms on the part of, US, or of Chinese media agencies, treating them like government agencies. Then Beijing responded, now it's the third round. These uh, uh, competition, these tit-for-tat acts, symbolizes an increasing competition, a struggle between the United States and China in the ideological and values area. Uh, China certainly uses the, uh, uh, the combat against the, con against the pandemic to demonstrate its impressive performance, to uh, demonstrate the superiority of its system, of its ideology, and by implication, the superiority of Chinese leadership. But certainly, the Donald Trump administration would, would not accept this, and it would like to uh, accuse China of spreading the pandemic, of hiding and refusing to uh, allow the international community to have the information promptly. At least in the beginning of the pandemic, around about December last year and January this year. Professor Chang, uh, China is uh, poised to convene its annual two sessions on May 21st. What messages can we expect from the leaders there? Well, according to the official media, in China, you can certainly expect that the Chinese leadership will claim that it did uh, a very, very good job in the combat of the pandemic. It would claim that this uh, combat, this victory, would symbolize the superiority of China's ideology, of China's system, and by implication, uh, the superiority of, of its leadership. It will try to uh, inform the nation and the international community of its strategy to revive the economy and probably indicate some of its uh, initial achievements at this stage. All right, Professor Chang, thank you very much for your time and thank your you. thoughts. Uh, Professor Park, amid worsening diplomatic and trade ties between the US and China, what impact can Korea expect, South Korea that is, and what can it do to ease the potential negative repercussions from this? Well, that's very... <coughs> important but at the same time very difficult question because I was already mentioned that it's kind of a competition between the hegemony competition between these two great powers but Korea has not many options we have to have a maintain this close ally with the United States at the same time we have the friendly relationship with China both of them are very critical countries for us but at this moment I can see some chance because Korea is one of the I think uh, one of the most effectively deal with this coronavirus. But we all know that it's kind of failed to have a cooperation among these two countries and also cooperation among the many countries in the world. So Korea can share our experience to the world and at the same time we can play a kind of a agenda setter role. So that's why we can bring this cooperation not only the United States but also China and other countries too. So that's I can see some kind of chance to it's, I know it's, it's not that easy, but it's uh, worthwhile to attempt to this kind of a, you know, attempt. Of course. Uh, William, <coughs> let's broaden our focus to include issues related to regional stability. Uh, following North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's reappearance in public, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo reiterated Washington's intentions to dismantle the reclusive regime's nuclear program. How do you expect Washington to address the long-stalled nuclear talks? I don't expect much progress, at least through the United States election in November. Uh, Donald Trump seems to be okay with treating this as a win, as long as North Korea stays quiet. Of course, that depends on if North Korea stays quiet. And uh, many people would suggest perhaps it would not be in their interest to do that, or they would not want to do that. So uh, we'll have to see how Donald Trump responds if that is the case. But I think he's, he's in a position where he really doesn't have the time <laughs> to put into North Korea at the moment. He really wants to treat this as a win and sort of just set it over to the side for now. And North Korea, I'm not sure, wants to engage in any serious diplomatic discussions, not knowing whether Donald Trump will be there after January of next year. I see.
Uh, Professor Park, mm. it has been reported that Chinese President Xi Jinping and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un have been sharing personal messages in recent days, mm. and Beijing has pledged to assist North Korea in its uh, efforts against COVID-19. What do you suppose is bringing these two countries even more closer today? Well, for China, there is definitely uh, reasons to help the North Korea because China has maintained the, their sphere of influence over the Korean Peninsula for the past several, like even thousand years. And also, because of this competition between China and, and United States, China has more reason to helping North Korea and put them in the, under their influence. So that's why already Chinese com the media confirmed several times that they are helping North Korea in the deal with the COVID-19. Also, I think they are going to help for this food shortage and other necessities too. And for the uh, North Korea, definitely they need to also some kind of a reason to get help and support from China too because of this COVID-19. Although the North Korea has you know, kept in a kind of denied that they have no confirmed case at all, but everybody kind of suspect that there is going to be a spread of the COVID-19. And so for that reason, and also they have a blocked their border in the um, 20th of January. So it's been the it's kind of a trade between with the China's lifeline for the North Korea, but they since they blocked all the trade, they have a very difficult time in terms of their economy. So definitely for that, the purpose, they need uh, some kind of support and help from China. Mm. Now, staying on the subject of COVID-19 then, so what mm. is the situation like in North Korea amid the global pandemic? I have Professor Park ki -bom from Harvard Medical School live on the line. Hello again, Professor. Hello, Sunny. Now, it's in its report, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs claims no COVID-19 cases have been reported in North Korea. What are your thoughts on this? Right. No, no one really knows, right, if there are cases of COVID-19 inside North Korea. But we, what we do know is that they're really good at public health interventions. For instance, strict border controls, social movement, isolation of uh, suspected cases. These measures are actually quite effective in reducing the risk of the virus entering the country and also minimizing the spread of the virus and the, therefore an outbreak. But North Korea actually does have some weaknesses. Uh, one is that their testing capacity is quite limited. They do have capacity capability, but they're limited in, this, in the sense that they don't have the testing kits. And they were provided some kits from Russia and from China, but they're not in large quantities. So uh, my understanding is that they able, they're able to perform maybe 60 tests per day, certainly not enough to test widely. And the other weakness they have is, is, the, is the capacity to treat COVID-19 patients if there's a surge. So one modeling stu study uh, estimates between 7,000 to 150,000 deaths if there were to be an outbreak in North Korea. And at a minimum, at the peak uh, stages, they'll need about 2,500 ICU beds. Uh, the implication is that these beds have ventilators and I can tell you that they, they don't have this many beds. They have a fraction of that. So that's a, one of their weaknesses. Mm. Professor Park, President Moon Jae-in has been calling for cross-border efforts uh, to contain COVID-19. What types of exchanges would you recommend to this end? Yeah, so I think looking at it from a purely inter-Korea uh, perspective is, is probably not a, uh, it, it's, you're limiting yourself. Uh, South Korea is limiting themselves to the other aspects of cooperating with North Korea, which is the multilateral platform. The UN agencies actually have uh, uh, offices inside North Korea. They have actually developed a COVID-19 uh, uh, cooperation strategy. I think it's best to, uh, as a member of the uh, mem member of WHO and UN, South Korea could be a technical partner as well as a donor. I think that's the best way to get things started. Uh, and then there may be some other opportunities for inter-Korea uh, uh, cooperation. And I think that you, you really have to work with the multilateral platform first. One final question, Professor. Could cross-border efforts to combat the virus serve as a catalyst, perhaps, for nuclear talks in the peninsula? I, I do. I do. And I'm very hopeful. I'm eternal optimist. Listen, the U.S.'s objective is really a denuclearized, denuclearized North Korea, right? And their tactics are, you know, are maximum pressure. South Korea's uh, objective seems to be peace, and their tactics are engagement. These are completely divergent strategies. And, and, and I think it's important for South Korea to really step away from uh, the, uh, the, the maximum pressure type of tactics that they've been aligned with, and then try to not develop a coalition with other countries that, 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 that actually see North Korea now as not such a threat that, 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 as the US does. So they'll have to sort of break away in some ways.
in, 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 when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, uh, North Korea. All right, Professor Park Bom, as always, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Uh, William, what is your forecast of inter-Korean ties in the future? I think that uh, since the Moon administration is uh, sort of politically bolstered from the latest uh, election here, and also his approval ratings, Moon's approval ratings are now, what, 70 percent, according to the latest Gallup Korea poll? I think he will continue to try to uh, improve relations with North Korea. However, I, at risk of sounding obvious, this needs North Korea's cooperation as well. I do think it's notable that a lot of people here in Seoul suggested that perhaps COVID cooperation could help improve ties. Now I'm hearing people start to say that perhaps um, ties will improve after COVID sort of uh, settles a little bit. Maybe North Korea is distracted by COVID. So I don't know which one of those things are true. I respect very much the, the, um, the persistence of, of the government here at trying for inter-Korean cooperation. And I, I would hope that soon they would have a willing partner that would be able to engage in some of this. Professor Park, this is probably my last question. Do you mm -hmm. believe the blame game between the US and China will escalate? Well, yeah, I think so, because until the election of the presidential election of the United States, I think there are a very high chance that President Trump will continue to blame the China for this spread the COVID-19 for his political purpose. And also I mentioned that this is more like a structural problem. So we are seeing the changing kind of world order because of these two great powers. They already got started to have a competition, but COVID-19 accelerated it. So I'm going to continue to see this kind of a very serious competition between these two countries. I see. All right, Professor, thank you for your thoughts. And William, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Now, that brings us to the end of this edition. We'll be back tomorrow at the SAR to talk about the new normal in the medical field amid, amid the COVID-19 pandemic. In the meantime, feel free to reach out to us with your thoughts and inquiries on our social media accounts or our homepage, arirang.com. Take care and see you tomorrow.